Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Sebastian van Heinegen. Sebastian is the president of Central Metric, and he says a future Super Bowl winner. I think he's probably looking a bit aged, uh, too old to be starting out as a rookie. So we'll cover all sorts of fun stuff today. We're going to explore why organizations are opaque and they lack internal visibility. Um, we're going to explore um, why the buyer's journey is so poorly misunderstood. Maybe there's a clue you, know, you might want to involve your buyers. Do you find that your organization is being held ransom to bottlenecks because someone is a team of one and they rescue, um, they micromanage? You know, what, what's going on? Why are they creating these blockages instead of releasing the creative capability of the people in their team? More often than not, we see early decisions made in the business having repercussions later. So if you think of the, you know, the sins of the fathers inflicted on the sons, well, early decisions in terms of your structure, your compensation scheme, the kind of culture, the kind of people that you go after, then that can have deep ramifications later. And when it gets baked into culture, then those chains are very difficult to break. So we're going to look at some frequently unasked questions. You know, why is it people have lazy whys, manic hows, uh, but they don't ask why enough? They don't have enough strategy or any strategy. Why is it that they're connecting pieces of technology? Do they even need it? Should they be connected? And if you do it that way, what are the repercussions on the, the poor people have to live with it? So, Sebastian, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's a, a pleasure. I'm really excited to dig into these topics because I don't see enough people really thinking deeply. There's too much of a rush. So what I'd like, first of all, is to get 60, 90 seconds on your history, and then let's yeah. just get straight into the meaty, grisly bits. Brief history on me. I came into consulting and revenue operations via the sales development function. So I started as an SDR. That's how my career was born, essentially. I am probably 20,000 plus cold calls in and an insurmountable number of emails uh, and LinkedIn messages in. And so I have literally been the end user of a revenue operations team's software platform. You know, that combination of CRM, sales engagement, data, insights, et cetera, et cetera. So I have been that end user. I've been the squeaky wheel saying that the process doesn't work for this reason, or I need support in this area. And I know what it looks like when you don't get that help uh, and how difficult it can be to hit your goals when the entire organization is not moving in the same direction. So I uh, job hopped a lot for that reason, also because I'm, I'm not a great employee. <laughs> and, you know, long story short, I um, two and a half years ago founded uh, what was a sales ops consulting freelance shop, which has now exploded into a revenue operations consulting agency. And we can probably talk about the differences there because to be uninformed, it probably sounds like I said the same thing twice. Well, it, it's <laughs> probably a good idea to do that because I'm not entirely clear. So um, uh, help me understand. Gotcha. We started out as your typical Salesforce admins on Upwork, charging an hourly rate. Our clients would come to us and say, we need this done. Can you please do it? We would do the thing and we would tell them how many hours it took, which is a great way to build a life in this world. You know, there are people who have whole businesses and careers based on being very good order takers. But with my co-founder and my experience, you know, not, you know, at that point, having consulted dozens of businesses already, we wanted to get on the other side of the glass, so to speak. Uh, and that's why my LinkedIn headline is and will always be revenue operations is an executive function. Mm -hmm. So your leader of technology and process is not an order taker and all of your strategies have to filter through their lens. Uh, because like you said, sins of the fathers, you could wind up with the wrong tech and the wrong process, just essentially hamstringing your development as a business and holding you back. The best product doesn't always win in this world, as we know, but the best designed sales process 
that provides the most value pretty much always does. This is really very exciting because we can get into some very uncomfortable and uh, uh, gritty conversations. <laughs> so my first question is this. As you are going through the ranks and you're witnessing these uh, issues, how complicit were the people who just preceded you into management in propagating the status quo? Completely, <laughs> completely complicit. Yeah, I mean, I would say as a manager, the outcome, you own the outcome, but you also own the process. And so even if it was handed to you, the process is now yours. And it's up to you to improve each small integral piece of it to you know find better efficiencies or you know get better numbers for your team. And you know, a lot of leaders they can kind of fall asleep at the wheel and think, you know, this is working. Maybe I have two to three high performers that are carrying the team and everyone else will just figure it out. There's a lot of they'll just figure it out mindset. Let's say fair management. Hmm? Let's say fair management or management yes. by abdication. Yep. Hands up in the air. Here's your phone. Here's your list. If you lose, you lose. But it's very You're immediately <laughs> replaceable. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll we'll put you on a pip, and within a month you'll be gone. And then we'll spend three months of salary hiring your replacement, and everything will be fine. <laughs> so help me understand, because I'm spending a lot of my time now researching how to have impossible conversations with people <laughs> who are intransigent and fixed of mindset and then helping them realize yeah. that there is a better way. And it's really very, very taxing. And however, what I'm conscious of is it's not about finding difference. It's about finding agreement. I'm curious, your advice to a new manager who's been through the SDR, maybe the A role, and it's mm -hmm. their first role in management. What are the boundaries that they need to establish upwards? As a middle manager? Yeah. I think the, the first boundary you set is around the outcome that you're trying to achieve and the levers that you have to achieve it. So make it clear and get agreement that this is your goal and that these are the things that you have to help you get to your goal. And then it's your job as the manager to make those two things congruent, essentially. Uh, here are the things that I can do, the levers I can pull, like the budget that I have to help get this team to perform at this level. So just make that clear from the start, because it's easy as a manager to fall into more of a counselor role at an individual level or more of a steward role of, you know, the team is working. I'm just going to take, again, laissez-faire, take a step back and let it go. I see something else happen as well, which is that managers get sucked into the job of doing, which they're mm. paying other people to do. They fall into the trap of supervising. Yeah. And they spend no time coaching because I'm too busy to coach. Idiotic response because <laughs> the reason you're too busy to coach is you're not coaching. Yeah. If anyone has any doubts and yeah, the words, I'm too busy too. The reason is you're not coaching. Yeah. You only have two lines on your job description as a sales manager. Hire the best people, yeah. get the best out of them. Yep. That's your job. Your That's job it. is not to carry a quota. So I'm very curious your thoughts in terms of player managers. Oh, never, never, ever, ever, ever do it. Ever, 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 ever. Never know. Right, got it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'll, I will make a caveat though. If, and I would like to see if this has ever been done. If you're going to do it, you need to compensate for both outcomes. If you have a player coach, they need a personal quota and their own personal commission plan and a team quota and their own team commission plan. It's a very simple equation. You need to incentivize the things that you want your employees to do. If a player coach has a personal quota, they're not going to manage. If they have a team quota, they're not going to sell. So if you're going to do it, pay them for both of the things that you're asking them to do. 
but also don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do it. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're not. I can't yeah. remember who I should attribute that quote to. But if <laughs> That's would. a nice one. Um, now, in theory, paying people for both is a great idea. In yeah. practice, what they will do is they'll focus on the thing that they have control over, yeah. which is probably their, their quota. Their personal quota, yeah. if they don't know how to coach. And if they've not been coached or trained how to coach, how can they? Yeah. The biggest challenge your middle management has largely is ignorance. They don't yeah. know what they don't know. You're describing the first phase of my career right now. <laughs> yeah. In my history is your future. That's the only difference. <laughs> and hopefully you won't eat quite so many cakes. So um, over time, you start to see organizations evolve and they start to put systems and processes in place. How often are you having to unpick the Frankentech sort of technology spaghetti that's morphed over the years? Because when they run out of people that they can throw at the problem, they start throwing technology at it. Yeah. And what would you say, 60, 70, 80%? of the technology is either duplicated, irrelevant, or never used. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say 90% of our clients come to us in that state, and at least half of their technology has overlap, should be replaced soon, or is not being used at all. So how much typically of their uh, overall marketing uh, spend is being wasted on duplicated and irrelevant and untrained. That's the other thing. Mm. Because of the fast turnover, often people come in uh, and then they leave and they leave with the knowledge of the training and no one's trained the, the next generation. Yeah, I mean, sales, marketing, success across the board. We, we just brought on a client where without getting too deep into the weeds, they use Salesforce. They had a 20 hour per week Salesforce resource who built their entire process in a complex coding language only native to Salesforce called Apex. And none of that is easily changed or monitored by anyone other than the only human being that set it up and administrated it who is no longer at the business. This is not the exception. This is the rule. It is very, very common. Uh, and not just for a piece of technology, but for the processes and flows within that technology to be so tied up in themselves uh, with a complete lack of just a simple document saying this button does this. When you do this, this will happen. Uh, and these are the reasons why we set it up the way that we set it up. So our number one kind of priority in months one and two with this client are literally untangling the knots of their Apex code and trying to convert it into a more easily manipulated version of that. You know, the I did an A-level, which is high school, uh, yeah. back in 1986 in computing. Mm -hmm. And my teacher at the time was ex-IBM. And he recounted a case of one programmer who was fascinated with farmyard animals. And so he had a coding system. <laughs> oh, no. And cows and ducks and different genesis, <laughs> uh, you know, and different types of duck and different types. Yeah. And he left. And that the bank was running this system that IBM had installed using farmyard animals. That's and hilarious. In the 80s, you'd have thought there'd be some governance brought in. But what is it about humanity that we don't learn from history? Yeah, I, I would even add to this. One of my favorite quotes that I've heard recently, and I, I can't even remember who told me, was that big tech innovates very slowly. And so those, since they're the fathers, those same mistakes IBM was making, they were just passed down because all those people, they went to the funds, the firms, and the businesses that they do it the IBM way, which is a tried and true method, and that it just compounds over time and, and it happens over and over and over again. That's why businesses like mine are able to exist, you know, oh. frankly. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> thanks, but, IBM. Because... Um, <laughs> There seems to be a pattern over the last 30, 40 years where the customer has become a more and more distant, inconvenient part of the whole process. And yeah. 
I've seen that happen to the detriment of so many companies. And it, it creates a terrible experience for the customer. The disconnect, the being thrown over the wall and having to start over again, and the miscommunication because of lack of coordinated or orchestrated coordination between uh, different departments at the handover points, communication, you know, CS being brought in early enough, all this yeah. kind of stuff. And I'm really fascinated about where the customer sits in most founders or uh, executive teams' minds. If I had to guess, I would say that they are ancillary. They're seen as ancillary to the process, not necessary, but a part of it which I think is the problem. How can they be, um, be necessary? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's almost like you you build the world's most amazing roller coaster, but the seats are too small for a human to fit in them. You've thought about the whole ride and the mechanics, and it's a feat of engineering that a piece of metal could move this quickly and in these directions and then flip in this way, but no human beings can fit on the ride comfortably. And so the ride is not popular. The park shuts down, the business fails. I think that's what it is. It's an over-engineering and you think you have this amazing funnel, flywheel, bow tie, you know, there's been so many names for it. And you haven't considered, if I was a person going through these steps, would I be happy? Would I learn something that helps me do my job well? And would I be incentivized to make a decision that benefits both parties? This then raises another interesting question about how we define the word sales and selling and what the, mm -hmm. the actual job to be done as a seller is. I'd be really curious about your take. I mean, what, what, what is our job as a salesperson? I think our job is to inform, engage, qualify, and sell. And sell is last. Sell is the last thing you do, if you do it at all. You know, you, you can even say that salespeople discover and start the project that ends in a solved problem. I don't think salespeople solve problems. I think that is very much overused in our world. I think the product solves the problem. The CS, the account management team, they're solving the problem. Salesperson has a huge part in that because they're helping you identify it. They're making sure you're a good fit for this solution. They're getting the information, they're handing it off. But the problem itself is not solved by sales. You know, we are the fact finders, the investigators, the hype men or women or, you know, other genders that are out there. <laughs> but essentially, we're there to build the groundswell and start the project so that it gets to a place where a problem is solved, a client is happy, and invoices are paid. Yes, and. Okay. I think there, it will depend largely on the space you fit into in the market. But I think far too many sellers attached to the product, the features, the functionality, the hitting quota, all of these kind of things. And that, that, yeah. in the, when we were prepping, you said something that there's a lack of curiosity, this drive to hit the number and yeah. chase the next letter in the funding series. I thought that was lovely, where they hit the number and run. Well, I always describe a lot of sales behavior as being a bit like a drive-by shooting. Uh, every three years, they come back for the renewal. And yeah, they call it SaaS. It isn't. It's just repackaged. And, um, you know, it's perpetual license. Yeah. Software. It's just licensed software. Yeah, that's um, really what it is. So th the customer hasn't really been thought about in this. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think selling should be a cooperative activity. Agreed. Where you as a seller and your customer, maybe partners or even competitors, are involved in getting your eyes and brains on the customer's problem, and then project managing the conversations. Certainly at the enterprise level, that seems to be a big part of our role, is the, the orchestration, the planning, the choreography, the right people have the right conversations at the right time in the right way, and have clear next steps to captain those, those conversations so that everyone else's crew in the one shared mission, which is to help the customer achieve the best decision for themselves for now yep. and the future. 
Now, that's anything but order taking. It is problem solving, but it's a very different level to the transactional seller who has become or is the byproduct of that revenue at any cost. Everyone mm. works to serve shareholder value. Ultimately, you can come in, strip the assets out of the company, fire everybody. As long as the investors walk out with some cash in their pocket, yep. everyone's happy. They're not. There are a lot of really pissed off, burnt out people who made you successful and uh, feel aggrieved, justified. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, I think it, it changes at scale. A smaller company, smaller deal size, smaller team, you know, maybe a, a rep that owns the full cycle. You know, they will be more focused on the problem in, in those cases, but they could also slide into that transactional churn and burn attitude. But you know, when we separate those parts of the sales process, and you know, mind you, procurement is also separated into different teams. So on both sides of the equation, we have multiple stakeholders. And that's why I always say that you know, real estate is a great feeder function into sales in this way, because in the same way as an enterprise deal, you're dealing with a you know, large ticket item, multiple stakeholders, deadlines that have to be met, uh, policies and, and kind of priorities that have to be you know, focused on. And then you're just driving towards that, what you are hoping and kind of advising is the best decision for the central person, which is the buyer. Again, the last few months have been really instructive for me as I've started to try to get to grips with this concept of jobs to be done. And the, the theory goes that there is a job to be done and everyone in the organization is subordinate to the, that or those jobs. They're not buyers, they're executors of the job. Gotcha. They, they play a part and they're one of many moving parts. Okay. And what's really fascinating is the number of salespeople who will stop at one or two people within an organization where they're 10, 12 people, then they wonder why they've got a 2.6% win rate. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay because my, my point being here, there are so many different moving parts in the sale nowadays. And People have access to amazing amounts of information, but it, it's the internet. Yeah. You can easily make a terrible decision. And so we're seeing a big trend where people want a seller free buying experience, but those customers are very high on the churn risk levels. Yep. Because they haven't had their questions answered, they haven't had someone challenge their thinking. And I think that's where salespeople, again, are often very weak because I think it is our responsibility to challenge our customers. 100%. Yeah. The best sellers are the ones that I'd say, I hesitate to say that selling isn't their number one skill, but it's almost that they become experts in their field, whatever they're selling into. If you're, you're selling HR tech, you are an HR consultant, essentially. And the value of taking a call with you is beyond using your solution. You know, it is the advice that comes with someone like yourself who speaks to dozens, if not hundreds of people in the same seat dealing with similar problems. And, you know, th that's what I think the best sellers are moving towards is a, an approach that is more consultative, more long tail, and just kind of throws value at you until you are ready to buy. And then even kind of pushing back when you think you're ready to buy and, and, making sure that you're qualified and that this is the right time and that this is the right solution. Well, again, this is where um, the data is really key. And yeah. so few people really are using their data well. When you look at it, the actual uh, wasted activity involved in cold email, cold marketing, cold outreach, cold, cold calling, bland, vanilla, uh, more yeah. content uh, from your marketing department. It's all about feature and functionality and self-referencing, uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, you spend a fortune doing that to create noise and be deaf uh, and deafen your prospects to, to your message. Yeah. And so few are taking the time to step back and think, well, what's a better way? Why are we not looking at, for example, second meeting ratios? 
Mm. As the second meeting tells me, they turned up, they were valuable enough to be invited back. Yeah. The first meeting just tells me that the SDRs hit their quota or didn't. Yeah. I don't care about them hitting their quota. I care about the outcome. The outcome yeah. is how does the team hit their number and deliver to the customer the outcomes that they're hiring from us and then how do we get them to stay? Because I don't want to have to go out and replace them. If yep. I'm losing 15%, every three years, I've got to replace half my customers. Yep. That's an awful lot of work and a lot of profit walking out the door. Yeah. It's a, everyone's favorite adage. You know, it costs X amount more to acquire a new customer than it does to retain an old one. Well, the profitability statistics that came out of Bank Sass's report in 2019 mm-hmm. are that new business generated an average of 18% profit, upsells yep. 170, exp- there you go. expansion sales 1150%. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. So you got 100 times more profit. Yeah. Like you want to work harder because somehow it's a rite of passage. Oh, give me a break. Yeah, new logos. New logos. The board deck needs the new logos, Marcus. <laughs> well, some, something struck me a couple of years ago after having spent 33 years beating my head against all going after new business a lot. And it's this. If you focus on your medium to long-term pipeline that starts generating cash maybe six to nine months down the road up to about 36 months out, mm. if you can just keep the wolf from the door in month zero to nine, maybe spend 20% of your time on that. Yeah. 80% on your medium to uh, long-term pipeline. Then your short-term pipeline takes care of itself. Yep. And you've got long-term pipelines. You've got breathing space. You've got time. You can pick and choose. And you might need maybe a dozen prospects in a year instead of 600. Yeah. I can then have 30, 40 relationships within that one account. How much better informed am I going to be turning up? You know, it, it, much better. It just yeah. makes sense. Like it, just simple logic. But I don't think people are using any logic. <laughs> They're not. But I, there's also limitations that are unique to each business. You know, some businesses, what they offer is what they offer. You know, there maybe there isn't an expansion opportunity with the stage they're at in their Fair process. Enough. Or maybe they have a long-term product. People are locked into those deals already. You know, renewals are not a thought process for them because these are five year deals, three year deals. You know, the funding does not operate on the same cycle as the revenue does. So I I think every company is different. Like, I think everyone listening here will have a reason why they have not focused on that. But I think that's the challenge is dig deep into that reason why and and understand that this is something that if you fix it, it will cascade all the way outward onto you know other projects, other needs. You can lower the cost of your sale for new business by expanding your current clients. I discovered a really interesting concept, which is how do you create non-customers? non-customers. Or how do you attract non-customers? So um, the a guy who founded Tata was uh, driving around, I think it was in Mumbai, and he saw mm-hmm. a family of five on a moped. And it was yeah. pouring with rain. And he figured, not a great safety, um, uh, uh, not a safe way to travel, and probably pretty unpleasant. Yeah. M- moped in the rain with five of you on it, slipping around yeah. on you know, shitty roads. So he decided to throw himself into the problem, which is how do you create a car that's cheap enough for a poor family to be able to buy the car? So yeah. they have shelter, and at least you know, they're not skidding around on two wheels. And it needs to fit five people in, by the way. And he managed to do it because he threw himself into the problem. And I'm really, really intrigued about sellers who really throw themselves into the problem and whether or not they can survive in an environment where they're having to carry that quota. Yeah. And it's it's funny. It's like a, it's a two-sided thing because you always say you want an entrepreneurial salesperson. And I think an entrepreneurial salesperson is more focused on the problem than their quota and building relationships that lead to sustainable growth rather than I need 10 meetings, 
at this amount of revenue by the end of the quarter, where on the opposite end, you still need those people to hit their quota. Uh, you know, that, that those numbers exist for a reason. So I think short term, there are many situations where they just won't survive. You know, I, I've, I've been one of those reps. I, I actually fired myself once. You know, I, <laughs> I was a, a first salesperson. We got eight to nine months in. And my feedback to the CEO was that this is not a sales strategy product. You need marketing, you need partnerships, you need PR. This is a come to us type of software rather than a beat the ground, show up at your door type of software. And he agreed with me, which meant my position was terminated immediately. So I was focused on the problem. I was fired for it. Uh, and I think there are countless stories like that out there. You regret um, it? No, not at all. Because in the long term, you know, that mindset has served me very well. And, you know, it's allowed me to create my own business where now I am totally dedicated to the problem. I, I learned something last week, so I'm going to ask you a very unusual question and feel free okay. to mind my own business. Uh, what do you regret in business? Oh, what do I regret in business? I think I had a lack of foresight at times. And I think um, I trusted my gut a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I, I did not act with enough caution throughout my career, which, you know, it's caused me to learn a lot of lessons in a short period of time, but I could have done so with less desperation, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I, I always marvel that I've lived this long and survived as far as I have uh, without someone stabbing me or beating me. Over the head. Um, but yeah. Yeah, my propensity for self-sabotage is legendary. Okay, so we've got this shift coming. We're mm -hmm. seeing a generational transfer. Um, we've, I mean, if you're selling of managing in this marketplace and over, you yeah, know, 22, 23, 24, you're going to have to be pretty bloody resilient. Yeah, you're going to have yeah. to have thick skin, you're going to have to be compassionate. You're going to have to be adaptable. You're going to have to be really good at workarounds. And you're going to have to be fantastic with your pastoral care, um, among many other things, because we're heading for what is probably one of the toughest trading periods. That I think this is my fifth recession. And the last one was quite tough. Um, yeah. It's going to be a lot worse, I think. You're talking about the COVID one, the housing one? or <laughs> Well, it's, it's just... Yeah, this um, slew of them. Yeah. Just, yeah, we've got World War Two and a half, maybe. Three. Yeah, we've got China's rise, America's decline, uh, yeah. Europe falling apart, the global inflation, you know, rising gas prices, supply nationalism, chain, water problems in California. The climate yeah. problems aren't going away; they're just only getting worse. <laughs> so, you, you've got this incredible environment which must be driving people's brains flush with adrenaline and cortisol and there yep. how can you create an environment of calm so that they can think and they can respond to their circumstance rather than react and probably overcorrect i mean i think that's its own its own podcast in okay. itself yeah just to simplify it i would say it starts with you as the leader you know, don't appear frazzled you know be honest if you're worried but you know don't show that energy don't lead with that energy you know you you're as the leader you are the steadying force and the one that sets the tone so be the one that sets the tone and you know set it towards the tone that you think is best for the team rather than a reactive one this is one thing that i've actually learned in my my side job which is a dj uh, i had a when I started out, I would play the music for the room. I would look at the room and say, I think the room needs this music. But as I've grown, I've realized that I am controlling the mood in the room. I have all the speakers, I have a microphone, I have everything at my disposal. If I want the mood to go up, all I need to do is start yelling and play upbeat music. And so find your version of that as a manager. Get people into the mood or tone or thought process that you want them to be, but also be understanding that 
there's a lot of negative information out there and people are dealing with their own shit pretty much. So also be understanding and empathetic. And I think kind of to, to tie it all up, I think that the job of a leader is to align the incentives of the individual with the incentives of the collective. You know, everything melts away and becomes a lot more simple if you know that by doing these things today, I will positively affect this thing, which will lead to a benefit for everyone involved. All that other stuff, you can talk about it, you can make it a focus, but you know, we have a tendency to come to work, put on our work hat and, and do the job. So set it up, set up a world where they can get into that mindset, do that job and understand that the work they're doing has meaning and is valid and is, is going to help the business as well as themselves. This is such an interesting question because I see the world of work and how people value it, what they derive from it, changing quite dramatically as the generations shift. Because when were you born? 91. 91. So you were just coming into the 92 recession. So you probably didn't realize that. So the one that hit you was the next one, which would have been the 2002, or 2000, we had a bit of a blip, didn't we? And then there was 2000. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I would, say, I would say I wasn't financially literate at the time, but like my first memory, like historically, was 9 11. Right. Right. Okay. Ah, that's really yeah. interesting. I was in fourth, fifth grade. They sent us home from school because there was an attack. So tell me this how has that shaped your perspective on your place in the world as a citizen? Uh, I mean, we. <laughs> So one thing, one main takeaway, which I don't know if this is the podcast for that, but yeah. screw it, I'll, I'll share it. Yeah. My main yeah. takeaway was when the entire world unites around one enemy or one action, you need to scrutinize that the most. Because what happened after 9-11? Where did the U.S. military go? What was the justification for that occupation? And what did we learn 10 to 15 years later? So that was my takeaway. It was like, okay, we can all unite around one idea and that idea can be completely incorrect. <laughs> and there's the pressure from the culture to fall in line. You know, I think that was actually one of President Barack Obama's like first political moments was he came out against the Iraq war when it was not cool to. You know, nowadays, everybody in there is trying to say that they had doubts at the time. But, you know, the whole nation united around that one idea. And upon further scrutiny, you know, maybe we should have had some extra thought <laughs> before well, just running up into that country. <laughs> that's really quite an advanced form of thinking. I'm very impressed uh, that, you, you. You took, you, that you took that out of it. Okay. Because... What, what I'm really interested in is how these events in people's lives um, cause them to experience the world and filter it uh, and how it affects values. So uh, in terms, and, and the reason I asked about regret as well is mm. Dan Pink did a talk at the Nudge Stock event uh, last week where he's released a book about regrets because regrets tend to point to what people value the most. Um, yeah. Wow. And so uh, I'm curious uh, because I think values is something that we really need to get uh, a much better understanding of because as your values affect how you behave even when no one is looking, yeah, that's really telling because if you can understand someone's values when you're hiring them, the one thing I don't look for diversity in is values. Uh, I have okay. um, an ecosystem that I'm putting together. We yeah. have four rules. No assholes. Yep. Never take advantage, even if you can. If the customer could benefit from two or three of the other partners within our ecosystem uh, from seeing what they can offer, it's your responsibility to bring them in because the customers, the third rule is buyer safety first. Yep. Yeah. So the buyer has to feel safer with one of us or any of us by their side on their journey than without us. Because mm -hmm. if they don't buy from us now, they'll buy from us in the future because we play the long yep. game. And then the fourth one is that 
we delight in our partner's success. Okay. If I bring you in, I could have won the business, but you win it, great. Customers best served. Yeah. Yeah. So those, like are the four, those are the four values that we've worked on so far. I think values is such an important filter uh, on how people will behave. And you talk about company values, but if they don't live them, they're not really a value. Yeah, they're just written down on a Word document and your website, yeah. Or painted on your wall to look good. Yeah. I don't know exactly how growing up in that time period has affected my values yet. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. Interesting. There's a, a book we were talking about earlier called The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe and uh, William... There was a Strauss, yes. Oh. Yeah, okay. And it was talking about this, these uh, historical cycles that have been lived through four, five, uh, five or six times before and predicting the one we are going through now uh, with yeah. depressingly accurate and graphic detail. That would be my book, book recommendation for today's episode. What would be yours? My go-to book that I think every human being should read is Thank You for Arguing by Jay Heinrichs. It's fabulous. I love, thank you yeah. for arguing. In fact, we had him on the podcast. It, it, it's the one uh, about rhetoric for any of you who- uh, uh, I'm, going, I'm going back for that. <laughs> uh, he was brilliant. I love that book. Thank you for arguing. It's a wonderful uh, book. Yeah. I think we might- It's one I go back to a lot. Yeah. And uh, the other one, um, I, I recommend this on almost every episode, Just Listen by Mark Dalston. If you're a member yeah. of the species, you need to read Just Listen and apply the stuff. It works. It's fantastic. Okay, you've got a golden ticket and you can go back and you can advise the idiot Sebastian, age 23. Mm -hmm. What one choice bit of advice would you whisper in his ear he'd have ignored? Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I would, I would just reconfirm how important the network is. I think that's one that I didn't pay attention enough to early in my career. I thought I could just trailblaze my way in and out of companies. And you know, the people I met along the way, I'd see them another time. I think managing and, and being intentional in your network is the most important thing I could have learned back then. Yeah. It's, it's sad that wisdom is wasted on the, uh, the old and youth wasted on the young. Okay. Sebastian, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's the best way. Uh, DM me, tag me in a post. I think I have links to either email me or, or um, set a call with me there, but that's where I am most active, LinkedIn. And who do you typically serve the best and what's your superpower? We serve CEOs, heads of marketing, heads of sales, heads of products at, I would say, in the Series A SMB to midsize space. And our superpower is building a buyer journey that is reportable, scalable, visible, easy to change. You know, essentially, you know, the, the saying that you can't build the plane while you fly it. Y'all focus on flying the plane. We build the plane while you fly it. That's really interesting. And how far along the buyer's journey do you go? Where, where do you begin and where do you end? End to end. Inquiry to renewal, uh, expansion, upsell, and referral. Okay. Because every step has its own technology, its own process owner, its own exit criteria, its own internal and external stakeholders, its own important fields, values, reports. You know, you can get, you know, we, we mock it all up in an Excel sheet and each phase has its own kind of rows. And it gets very complex, but the end result is you have a blueprint that you can build your entire revenue organization from. That's really impressive. Okay, well, we need to dig into that offline. Excellent. Sebastian, thank you. Thanks for having me. So this is Marcus Cappy signing off from the Inquisitor podcast once again. If you want to get a hold of me, my email address is marcus at laughs-last.com. And if you're the owner or CEO of a tech company and your goal is to generate annual recurring revenues in excess of 20 million, maybe we should have a call. Right now, I'm helping companies like yours achieve genuine, sustainable hypergrowth, profitable hypergrowth, let me be clear about that, with highly engaged and highly productive employees who love giving discretionary effort and clients who stick with you year after year. So if you are up for a brief conversation, then I'm happy to share some ideas with you 
and strategies that can help you achieve profitable growth. One idea that you might want to mull around with is product market fit as a service, being able to establish that within one quarter. If you want to get hold of me, Marcus at laughs-last.com. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. Happy selling. Bye-bye.